Welcome to the Voice of Mountain Sledding, the Mountain Sledder Podcast with Mike Reed. We are so excited to have one badass snowmobiler with us today. Nadine Overwater, thanks so much for joining us. You betcha. Wouldn't miss it. You traveled out from Revelstoke this morning to be here in Golden. We're in the MSD Warehouse, Mountain Sledder Magazine, right here in the heart of Golden. The mecca of snowmobiling, this whole valley we've got. Golden, Revy, Sycamus, just some of the best sledding in the planet. Yep. Here we are right in the heart of it. Nadine, you and I met probably, oh gosh, is it 15 years ago now? A long oh, time ago. Oh, at least, yeah. <laughs> a long time ago. At that time, I think I was filming for Slednecks. You were guiding at the time in Revelstoke yep. and, and kind of fresher into the scene, but ski pulling, paying your dues, just oh, getting yeah. hours on the sled and getting better by the day. And it shows because... Last year, with 509, you kicked out an an incredible segment that was so condensed, so quick, but it kind of brought me back to some of the older, you know, Slednex segments and some other 509 stuff that we put together. It was so bangerang in like a short condensed period. Take us through what it was like to put that video together last year. Um, well, it actually worked out really good for me. I knew exactly what I wanted to do last year. And it was just that like old school, short and sweet and banger. And, uh, I, I had a plan. I knew the zones I wanted to film and it was just a matter of like teeing up the weather and the conditions for it. And I got super lucky. Um, we got the weather, we got good snow and, uh, I had a filmer and local filmer in Revelstoke. So it was like pretty key to being able to get that done quickly. We actually only filmed over two days and it was just Which like is incredible. one after the other. Like I had the plan. I knew where the light was in the morning. We went there and we just like banged them all off. They're all really close. And, uh, yeah, it's been a while because I've had a few injuries over the past few years and it was just time for redemption. And um, I just wanted to, yeah, put that segment together, make it short and just put my money where my mouth was and show that I'm still pushing a little bit in the backcountry and yeah, I representing think the women. Anyone who saw that segment would definitely say you're pushing because you. I think you raised the bar to a new level. Thank you. <laughs> it was awesome. And shout out to Josh Schneider, you know, awesome filmer there, put it together behind the scenes and then I delivered the footage. I was able to edit it. So it was just a huge collaborative effort. Yeah. And like you mentioned, for the stars to align, it doesn't always happen that way where it's the right weather, the right snow conditions, your sled's running, your body's in good enough condition to be hucking like this. But yep. the stars did align, didn't it? Oh, they did. Absolutely. And living in Revelstoke allows you that opportunity to kind of be a little bit choosier with the weather, right? You know, being an avalanche forecaster yourself and a professional in that industry, you know what the snowpack is doing. You've been kind of cataloging it all season and you know when the right time was to hit all these features. Yeah, absolutely. And last year was a real doozy on the avalanche front. Like, I mean, we had this deep persistent week layer that was just like haunting us all winter. I don't think I really pushed into new zones last year at all. Like I was riding the regular riding areas like Boulder and Frisbee and, you know, sail here and there, but like, it was scary. So, um, to put that segment together, I knew it had to be only in certain areas cause we were riding steeper train, but, uh, you just kind of mitigate those and make sure you don't have train traps, make sure you have people there with you for support. And then, um, yeah, but it, yeah, it teed up perfectly. Has listening to the mountain sledder podcast got you thinking of upgrading your ride? No matter if you're looking for sleds, two wheels, four wheels, or even watercraft, Riders has you covered. Riders are power sports dealerships known for their rock solid reputation of providing excellent service, support, and satisfaction with each and every unit that rolls off the showroom floor. With two locations in Edson and Rocky Mountain House, you can easily pick up your new ride or have yours serviced with trained professionals who literally live and breathe motorsports. They carry Skidoo, Lynx, Can Am, KTM, Sea Rocky Mountain and Giant Mountain Bikes, Kawasaki, and Marlon. Why have athletes like Riley Suhan, Cody Borchers, Regan Sieg, and Nadine Overwater chose riders? Well, it's because they're simply the best around when it comes to motorsports. Visit Riders in Edson or Rocky Mountain House today or shop online at riders.ca. That's R-I-D-E-R-Z dot C-A. 
So take us through a couple of, like, to me, there was one standalone feature that was really cool where you kind of lined up two drops, you kind of dropped into a zone and then lined up another drop. Like how cool are those and, and terrain navigation? Because like when you're in the top, when you're watching it, you're like, oh yeah, she's going to do that drop and that. But when you're on the sled, yeah. you're just kind of like going off of something that you have to have confidence in knowing what you're doing. Yeah, you really have to like look at your terrain from the bottom. It's it's a skill that takes so many years because even people like newer people that you ride with that are competent riders but are looking at something from the bottom and then like going to the top and they're like 300 meters the wrong way, you know, just having that kind of mental capability to like line yourself up and pick those landmarks. But that one was a funny one. Um, that double drop I had attempted probably like eight or nine years ago with Donovan Skelton. We were doing some filming on the side and that thing kicked my butt. So I came off the first top drop and it bucked me funny and I ejected off my sled because I didn't think I was like lining up the next lower drop up and it was it's a pretty steep slope so you can't really like stop on the slope so you're kind of just like you're going or you're not going so I bailed out and then my sled ended up doing the second drop perfectly fine but it ghost rode it out so I was just like this thing has been in my head for so many years and I'm like I gotta get that thing and I love it I like seeing lots of other people pushing the envelope and like I really like those technical like doubles where you have to like navigate a feature and then get over to another one and it's not just one single hit so that one was cool the snow was super deep so I came off the top the first one felt pretty good but it was like blowing over my face and then trying to line up where the next drop was um but it was pretty obvious once you're on the slope because the next drop was like kind of the only one on the rest of that slope and it just like far left of this cliff band. So you you knew the spot. You just had to get to it. And what about some of the other ones where you were able to kind of line up, boot pack into and kind of be a little bit more calculated on? Like I'm thinking there's a pretty iconic drop. There are quite a few other guys have done it before. Brad Gilmore and stuff comes to mind in that zone. And there are like probably 60-ish foot drops, you know, maybe yeah. 70-ish foot drops. Like very legit, large, sizable stuff. And you were just having an awesome segment, like an awesome day going off. It must have felt pretty good. Yeah, it did. It felt great. And like, you know, those ones that you're setting up, they're single entry kind of like not technical. I mean, they're technical in that they're big and like they're usually into little shoots. But um, if you do the work before, like I, I find myself, even if it's a big drop, as long as you set yourself up for it, Uh, there's really not a lot to think about like once you're in hit mode so you know you're waiting for cameras to roll you've packed in your line land or in run you know where your landing is as long as you come into your in run in line then not too much can go wrong I mean you say that I've had things go wrong in the past but (laughs) you say that but just the angle of the sled yeah you ideally want the track and skis to hit the snow simultaneously at the yeah. same time and ride out nicely and yeah. how how many times have you seen when guiding or anything like this with newer riders that you know they have land tail heavy that i think that's pretty natural oh, to yeah. do in jumps or drops but drops especially you really have to have this like unnatural feeling of allowing that nose to come yeah. down because the landing is so steep yeah that it's very you want to be riding that sled pretty horizontally but when you go off that drop you got to let that nose drop down and i think it's something to like get used to but in that segment you were just like buttering all the landings and looked very much in control and like everything looked really good thank you yeah years of practice (laughs) that's it i was you know making a lot of mistakes for many years and then you just slowly you're you become so comfortable on your sled that that's not even really part of the thought process anymore it's just an attachment to you and yeah just hitting the sweet spot also a lesson hard lesson i've learned <laughs> hard lesson, yeah literal hard lesson because yeah. when you land not on the sweet spot it hurts yeah it's not enjoyable um that was a segment tied in with your women of winter and you've been doing that for a few years now where it's a contest yep. where you kind of call out a lot of the other women in the snowmobile industry to say like what are you guys doing out there i want to see what you guys it's kind of like a fun film contest or whatever on social media and 509 gets behind it but hats off to you you you've been pushing the sport in a lot of different areas and we'll get to you know your charity ride and things that you've done in the future here but the women of winter is really unique and it's super cool what you're doing 
Yeah, I love the Women of Winter and it's really cool. Like 509's really developed that. They have the 509 Women Instagram page and um, I think it sort of all ties in with the Women of Winter. Um, Girls want to be a part of it. It doesn't mean you have to be like a raging big backcountry sledder. If you go up with your family and trail ride, it's just like it's a part of the community and uh, the camaraderie. And yeah, it's it's a really cool thing that we're building slowly and it's gaining traction and um, hopefully lots more entries in years to come because uh, as long as I'm around, the contest is going to run and hopefully <laughs> well beyond me. I think you've, you started something great, a great movement. How cool is it to look at what you do for the first two minutes of that segment in the Women of Winter last year? and like really raising the bar of women rider and proving that it's capable and what you guys can do out there. And then, and then tying it into like grassroots coming back to like people starting snowmobiling or newer into the industry and stuff like kind of seeing it come full circle. Yeah. And I mean, it's a, it's a balance, right? I don't want everyone to feel like overwhelmed with that segment, but I just thought like last year was a good year to do it. And that is like something that maybe you can, um, achieve or like aim for a lot of young girls up and comers. Um, and you don't have to be young to be an up and comer either, but it's just like with progression and learning, um, to where you can actually take it to and not just like, you know, the safe route of just enjoying pow turns and stuff. But if you're actually really into it or you have other skills, like maybe moto skills and, and you want to bring it into the winter world, um, the possibilities and just kind of like setting the bar high. Cause I don't want us to get complacent or be comparing ourselves to men all the time. It's like, no, we're, we're competent and we kind of have our own side of the world of the winter world. And and uh, yeah, you spend the time and you'll be totally capable to, to hit big things. Well, I think you're, you're representing every woman right out there really well. You're a hell of an ambassador. Um, you downplayed that a little bit, I think, when you say like, oh, well, you know, like you set some goals or whatever, but you genuinely enjoy that. And ever since, you know, you and I started riding together, if there's a jump there, you're wanting to hit it. You have that desire to get the sled in the air. And like you said, like pull it from other disciplines, whether it's mountain biking, which you shred at in the summer, or dirt biking, that sort of thing. It's just like you genuinely enjoy that airtime on the sled. Yeah. And I think like we could go down a real rabbit hole here, but I think that has a lot to do with like personality types and, um, <laughs> you know, issues there. But, issues. Um, <laughs> Good things. Yeah. You know, I just, that rush, right. And, uh, some then like as you progress like you lose that rush on the smaller stuff so then you have to like step it up step it up find new things and um you know the feeling of when you stomp things is like pretty next to none like it feels so good everyone around you is excited you have this like upwelling of just like sheer joy inside of you and um you know you look back on what you just did and and you're just like so fired up and it's just a feeling that you can't really obtain any other way besides that adrenaline rush so you've done obviously some big drops that we just saw some you know big jumps things like that have you ever gotten to like climbing like are, you live in revelstoke some of the mecca the you know big monster shoots in the 90s and all these iconic shoots and different things that guys climb do you ever have that desire to do um, any climbing or anything like climbing scares the shit out of me <laughs> It's funny because like, you know, you look at things from the bottom, obviously, when you're climbing something and like some of the shoots I watch some of you guys climb up and I'm like, that is the one thing that really actually scares me because it just seems so consequential to me. And it's like, usually you get up, it starts off really mellow and then you have to get into like some cruxy, like no turnaround zones. And, and to me, that's just, yeah, not, I don't know. Uh, yeah climbing's not my thing although I'm really looking forward to hopefully if all the stars align this year going down to Jackson Hole to do the hill climb but that's a little bit different yeah um that's a whole different beast in itself it's like a mix of like snow cross and other disciplines and climbing and rodeo yeah Yeah. yeah, rodeo that's a good example yeah bull riding but yeah climbing has always been yeah a little bit of a miss for me like I'm not overly like attracted to doing it. I'm not going out there to hill climb, but sometimes we have to like climb. It's a necessity. Isn't gnarly it? stuff to get into zones. And um, yeah, that steep shoot climbing. A couple of years ago, we talk about, you know, climbing and to access areas. 
a couple of years ago, we did a really cool adventure ride. You grabbed a couple of girlfriends and uh, Josh and I were filming. And that ride, like you're mentioning, like when you want to get somewhere, it is part of the discipline of backcountry swimming is being capable and comfortable to you, your limits of getting into different zones. So it's like descents, you know, you're going down super steep stuff, side hilling across something, um, you know, with maybe consequence underneath you and really having that, like, I can't let go of my sled right now. Or like you're mentioning, like climbing up something to be like, okay, we got to have a good turnaround plan, a good down route if we're not going to make this first yeah. climb. And I remember there was a couple of climbs where we had to punch it, you know, and track pack each other. Some were on turbos, some were on NAs. Like I was on a 155 NA, I think. Yeah. And it was just like having to ride in tracks to get to that, but you had to, yeah. to get to that next zone. So things like that are so fun to look back on, you know, again, the exploratory mission with Rob Alford and oh Riley God, Suhan yeah. and you and I, and in, in the creeks and trying to like get up, <laughs> that was like a lot more condensed, but like then tree riding and climbing. And it's, yeah. it's funny that you don't love climbing, but it's a necessity in the backcountry oh, ride for is. sure. And like when you're exploring too, it's just like a, it's a bit of a different concept too. Cause like, you know, areas where you're doing the same climb or the same access, you kind of know what's there. But when you're just like, I need to get up this, I don't know what's on the other side. Do I have to make sure I stop at the top or am I like committed, committed falling into the abyss? Is it cliff out? Like, you know, that adds to the, to the flavor. <laughs> uh, a couple of years ago, we invited some of your snowboard friends to come uh, for your 509 segment and we had an absolute blast for a few <laughs> days. How cool was it to see them push themselves on the sled? I know you were kind of there at one point too, starting in the industry and like how far you've come now to be like, oh no, this is how you carve. Let me ski pull you, follow me, yeah. I'll set tracks in. Yeah. How cool is that for you? That was a really fun day because I've learned a lot from those ladies. And like the big part, like we were talking about earlier is how to like spot your lines when you're trying to tee up certain lines from the bottom. And those girls ride big, big AK lines and you have to be really dialed on where you are in the terrain and you're looking at it in a mirror essentially so you're looking at it from the bottom and from photos and then you get to the top and you're trying to like then reverse it in your mind because you have to navigate right of that tree left of that rock and it's all happening really fast so I've learned a lot of that from those ladies um so for me to be able to like share some of my sled skills with them and also they've used sleds since like we've all started on sleds at the same time but they've always used them as access. So it's kind of like a tool that they use, but they'll ditch it way too soon, in my opinion. Whereas I'm like, let's get there. Like, I don't want to skin anywhere. I want to sled right to the spot and then snowboard down. So I'm starting to push them to do that more. And I think, you know, they're seeing benefit in that too. And just like trusting themselves a little more, getting farther on their sleds. Yeah. And they were, uh, we took them in some pretty cool areas. Yeah. It, it was cool to see that you did exactly that. Like it was like, let's get to the top of that ridge. And you guys were tr like <laughs> trandoming at some points where the three yeah. girls were on one sled getting up. And it was cool to see that that access was able to, I mean, the sleds nowadays are so capable oh, to bring, yeah. it's not, you know, the sled that's limiting, it's the rider to be able to get yeah. you there. So if you have the imagination, there's a lot more, most often you can get there one way or another. Oh, for sure. That was a lot of fun. So when we first met, I think you were guiding at Great Canadian, was it? Yep. Yeah. So you were guiding a Great Canadian and oh, you put a thousand hours on sleds the, those did. years yeah. when we first met. And yeah, it was just like your progression was like an exponential graph of starting out grassroots to going like, you know, better than a lot of the group that you probably started riding with around you. Yeah. And I mean, like I owe it all. Those were my formative years of sledding. Like, uh, riding every day you know you're riding five days a week you're with clients that have varying ability levels so some days I'm teaching people how to ride and some days I'm the weakest rider and yet I'm the guide um so yeah I think I learned the most through those years because you had to describe how to ride and you had to like teach people how to ride properly in deep snow and so you actually had to think about what you were doing um like and then you're always, it. yeah, you're always on a sled. So it just becomes like commonplace for you. And you're just putting so many hours and so much seat time in that if you don't improve, then I feel like there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you got to get better. Was there better. ever an aha moment to be like, 
that's how I describe carving or initiating a turn to a client where you're just like, why didn't I just say that for the first four years? It would have been so much easier just to describe it this way. Or is it always just like, you got to kind of feel it or experience it for your first carve and then just try it a few times to understand throttle. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, everyone learns differently. And to be honest, I was like the classic, like, like I, teach like a guy for my first few years where I'm just like you just do it like just watch me yeah this is how you do it and then then follow me it's like what's so hard about it (laughs) what's wrong with you and then you know as I got to work with like Brianna Lucar who is like a really good friend of mine and my tail guide and just being with Cody and people giving you tips you're like oh actually yeah light bulb that makes sense and then also like I find this year and last year sleds are becoming very similar like between riding Polaris and Skidoo um but in previous years like they rode very very different differently so if I had clients that were on like a different machine than me I'd have to actually like get on the machine and and figure out how it would work because it's all yeah it's just like balance points weight transfer and throttle is what it is but um Easier said than done. Easier said than done. <laughs> yeah. And, and then it also depends on the terrain and the snow you're in and, you know. Well, and how much of a, like to wrap your mind around, it's just natural nowadays to counter steer into a turn. Yeah. But to, to get someone onto a quad or side by side or a vehicle or something, it's just like, you're not counter steering to turn the direction you want to go, you know? So it's so against their mindset to be like, yeah turn and just trust it's going to go there turn and right to go left yeah you crazy <laughs> yeah, i'm gonna hit that tree yeah. no you won't you're gonna hit it if you try and turn into it yeah. believe me yeah uh, no what was, what was some of the craziest things you saw in those years of guiding like was there one standout where you're just like oh my gosh i can't believe someone did that on a sled um there's like a million stories right but there's a few times like i had a lot of experiences in my early years because i was one of like the only female guides out there so people are coming from all over the world and then they show up in the room for their like morning meeting and it's like this chick walks in and just dealing with that and i remember in particular like my lead guide steve scott amazing friend and good dude yeah just the dude he had my back all the time and he was like, no, you tell them if they're not happy with you after today, then we'll switch you out. And so that was my spiel every morning. I'm like, I know you're not happy, but <laughs> you will be by you're the stuck end of the with day. me today. So <laughs> suck it up. And, uh, you know, I had a few clients, this one French group in particular, and they were just like mad. Like, <laughs> Got the chick. What the hell? Like this is bullshit. We pay for this. And I was like, okay. If I can't keep up to you guys or you guys don't have a good day, I'm buying you dinner, whatever, right? So we end up having like the most epic day they've ever had, which actually wasn't that hard to provide because like they're coming out from Quebec. We have like big mountains, even if there was no snow, it's like the most beautiful place you've ever been. But we get into this one zone and they're like pretty like excited and like you know, it's like herding cats and I'm trying to just get them in and I'm like starting to get frustrated because they're starting to just like take off. We're under like a pretty big slope. You know, I can't recall exactly, but avalanche hazard wasn't like really high at the time, but it's just like certain protocols where you're like, it's just a no go all the time. There's just no point riding it. And, uh, this one guy was having a real hard time staying off that slope. And I was just like, buddy, you got, you know, like one more chance and just like wrap straight up, just can't stay off the thing. So I grabbed his key out of his sled and I was like, bumped the group over into like a big fresh opening. Like no one had touched it. It was back of Boulder and, uh, let his friends ride around for 20 minutes while I pulled his key. And he was like super pissed at me. And I was just like, Oh, I'm getting fired. So this is the end, you know, like really pissed off the clients today. And his friends just loved that. I did that. Cause I guess the guy's, you know, personality. He's a loose cannon anyway. Yeah. And, uh, anyways, the end of the day, it, it, I gave his key back. He listened for the rest of the day. We had a good day. Everyone came home safe. And, um, he asked me to marry him. <laughs> It was, I don't think he'd ever been told what to Put do by a woman. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm going to use that tactic more. I didn't marry so him. So it worked. Um, but yeah. Still single. Things like that. Yeah, <laughs> Not still married. Single. Not married. And yeah. Anyways, different different podcast. Um, 
yeah, there's lots of stories like that. And, you know, I really love getting like my Swede Norwegian clientele too, because those guys really push you and like kind of challenge you to like balance your like safety guiding exploration and like group management skills because they really, really want to go for it and they have the skills to do it. So typically I'm like the weakest link in those groups and, uh, you know, they're coming back to dig me out so that we can like get into this zone that none of us have ever been to. And, um, yeah, so it's pretty cool. I have a, a lot of experience with guiding and a lot of great groups and still to this day, you still take some of the Scandinavian groups in, like you mentioned, to have experiences like that, where they're yeah. almost pushing your skill set in a way where they trust you because you know what the snowpack's doing and the terrain and pushing that. But then they always seem so fit and they could just keep pushing. Can't they're, they're so almost good. like superhuman. Yeah. yeah. Like they need, you need to bring like jerry can stacked on jerry can, which is nuts because any other normal client, like after you burn a tank of gas, they're good. That is like, yeah. they are they're toast, toast. Like you can barely hold on. But these guys are like, yeah, 10 a.m. I'm out of gas. <laughs> like, oh, Maybe a long day. Can we heli drop in fuel, please? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can so. I sit and watch you guys? I know. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. And yeah, Bergmark, we were just talking about that. Uh, you've helped them out a little bit with getting them, you know, trucks and vehicles and access and places to stay, I'm sure, and things like that. But yeah, it's cool to see your old Toyota, which was so iconic. So many people are like, I remember that <laughs> truck. And now they're using it to yeah. get around when they come to Canada. It's so cool. Yeah, the thing won't die. <laughs> it just keeps going. Yeah. Um, we're coming into, we're recording this right now, coming into uh, winter 2023-2024. And you are coming into your, is it eighth annual charity yeah, ride? The charity ride. So this was a very cool... Um, event that you stemmed I don't know what made you think of hosting uh, you know a charity based get together ride with a bunch of uh, well known riders and athletes in the sport and then inviting in you know just people who want to be involved in you know being around that scene I guess yeah it actually it built itself because the very first charity ride I think we had like maybe 10 girls and it was more for my friends because I kept we live in a community full of athletes. So I have a lot of like professional skier, professional snowboarder friends. And they're just like, teach me how to sled. And I'm just, I don't have time to like take every single friend out individually. And like, so you just, you're like, Hey, listen, you guys make a small donation. It started out super small. Like we maybe raised a thousand bucks and, uh, which was still, you know, something worth we're yeah, donating. Yeah, totally. And so they did that and we all went out and had a great day. It was super fun. And then the next year they wanted to do it again, but other people wanted to do it. So I had to bring in some more guides. And and then after that, some guys started wanting to do it. And uh, yeah, like honestly, it just built itself. I invited people out. Everyone wants to be a part of it. And it's also a pretty fun time for all of us like in the industry to get together and, and go for a ride and it's a great reason to bring the family together for sure. Yeah. We call it the family, but you it know, is. everyone's brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles in the sled community. Uh, when we get to cross paths, it's even instances like this, we're recording a podcast. It's a lot of fun. It's yeah. a lot of fun behind the, behind the camera and off, off camera as well. Um, it's a really cool event in the timing. So a lot of, you know, there's lots of spring flings down in Colorado that they do in different areas and, you know, climb usually has their big ride and 509 spring heli shoots and things like that. But I think you're pretty unique to do it to kick off the season in December that you've hosted it for the last mm-hmm. eight years. And like you mentioned, it's grown to huge proportions. Now you made like last year, what was your donation? I think we were like 15 grand or something. No, not quite 15. It was like around 11 grand. I think last year it's in huge. that ballpark. Yeah. yeah. And like you mentioned, it's a really cool star studded event where people get the opportunity to brush shoulders with some of the best in the industry as far yeah. as backcountry snowmobilers. So Hats off to you for what you created and hopefully it's, you know, got legs for years to come. It's, it's a really cool event. I know lots of people look forward to it. So yeah, thanks. where do they check it out? Uh, yeah, you can check it out. It's on my website. Um, actually that's probably kind of it. If they, you follow me on social media, they just got to DM you. Just, yeah. You just, just got to send me on an Instagram email or Facebook and yeah. <laughs> get on with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, very cool. Yeah. We're looking forward to another successful year of that 
this year and then that brings us into kind of midwinter is there anything exciting you're looking for you mentioned jackson maybe but what's what's winter 24 got in store for you yeah i have a couple projects uh in the works that I can't talk about yet today, but, um, we're excited to hear, to hear barring, more about. Yeah. Barring those it's, um, I have my clinics are already booked up and a little bit of private guiding and I been working a lot. Like I own my own company and have been like really busy the last few years. So this year I'm really trying to focus on taking the winter off and just like do some of these side film projects that I've wanted to do for a few years and maybe just like ride for fun. No way. Yeah. What is that? Actually, it's always fun, but... But it's a different kind of fun, isn't yeah. it? When you don't have the pressure of, you know, an end task and goal in mind and a big group or you're filming or, you know, guiding or doing whatever, free riding, as you mentioned, is like a little bit few and far between these days. But when you get to do it, it's liberating, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty good time. Do you find yourself living in Revelstoke? Are you a bit of a fair weather rider? I know some people are. Um. Yes, Yes and no. I mean, like if I have other work to do and the weather sucks or we're riding the storm out, for sure I'll do the other work. But also if if all you're doing, you know, if you're taking the winter off to the sled, then that's kind of your exercise. So if you don't have a life day planned, you know, the garbage in the mail and all that jazz, then really even just getting out for a few hours to, to go for a rip. That accessibility must be unreal. I know we did a um, mountain bike kind of afternoon or after work ride or whatever a couple summers ago and being in the mecca right in revy just allows that to happen where it's just like oh you put in your eight or nine hours today and then you brush shoulders with someone heading up the mountain or whatever to do whether it's yeah. skiing snowboarding mountain biking whatever it's just that lifestyle there where like you said you're not spending like two or three hours in the gym you're spending two or three hours on the mountain yeah and it's crazy even like you look at all the people that travel so far to come ride in revy and then like you know they come for the weekend and then sunday after riding like a six eight hour day wet gear exhausted just like getting in your truck for like seven hours you're talking to one of them right now <laughs> i know I'm like how do you do it props to you guys and uh but now I've been spoiled and I don't, I don't think I could ever, even in golden, you know, like to come out to courts, it's like a half an hour. Are you kidding me? No, that's no. That's a big, that's a big day. That's a long drive. <laughs> yeah. I do remember, oh, as a kid growing up sledding, like we're right on the edge of the Rockies, but it's still a two hour drive one way. So you're up, you know, five o'clock yeah. in the morning, get loaded up, drive two hours, unload in the dark. 50k trail ride yep. into the mountains you do your day and come out it's a long day it is it's a huge day and yeah. in revelstoke you just get spoiled oh i've been tainted i don't have to stay in hotels <laughs> i come home i have like a hot shower cook some dinner so and yeah anyone coming to revelstoke what do you give them for advice as far as like come this time of the year to experience this you'll want to see that yeah. i mean like the holiday train rolls through the cn yeah. or whatever it is puts Avoid that on that. and <laughs> Yeah, it's, but there's things to do exterior of just sledding, right? Yeah, there is. There's lots to do in Revy. I mean, it's getting really busy now. So, in all honesty, it's it's tricky to like eat out or find accommodation and things like that. So you got to be a little bit organized on that front. Um, but yeah, obviously the sled in Hot Springs. If you haven't done that at some point in your life, that's is, a cool novelty. For it's sure. a good for a down day. Um, but I uh, always tell people there's like two Revelstokes to experience. There's a Revelstoke like December, January, maybe early February. And then there's a Revelstoke like probably April. I'm really yeah. thinking April, but even into May. Yeah. And they're two totally different experiences. Oh yeah. April, May is like, well, you're, you're into a shoulder season already. You're past the, you know, all the Europeans coming over and yeah. people from the States coming up to experience the, the mountains. Spring. So you're not, you're not like fighting for like you saying like no. reservations at restaurants or staying in a hotel they almost yeah. welcome that and plus you're almost guaranteed to get a sunny day in there somewhere yeah and the days are ways. long so yeah you, you can you know and you, you can multi-sport you know yeah, that's true you can, like go sledding for the day and probably get a mountain bike ride in or dirt bike in yeah, yeah down in the valley and then there's mid-season where it's just like if you want to burn calories mm -hmm. really test your riding ability in some of the most kind of challenging terrain because even a simple pow turn in a meadow with four feet of fresh is like hard to accomplish Yeah. without, and then stopping, you know, you got to stop on a track or plan that because yeah. you can't just stop anywhere. I think that's the Revelstoke you need to experience. Like yeah. 
if that's what you're coming to Revelstoke for is the snowmobiling, that that is the true, you know, heart of snowmobiling in Revelstoke is our deep snow. So spring riding to me, I'm, I don't love it. I am sure you already interviewed Cody Borchers and like, you know, even it. Andreas Bergmark, he's just like hates pow. And I, I find it hilarious and I love going out on pow days with him. Um, but like, yeah, that's what we're known for. That's why this industry is developed there and all the like heli ski and other winter related activities. We get like such good snow. We talk about snowback lots and, and what makes Revelstoke so unique. I saw it, I heard it summed up by Carl Kuster, who said it's probably, it's the most inland rainforest in North America, which allows it to have all that precipitation, but you're so far from the coast, you're not getting that same like coastal snowpack that's really pugged up and it sets up quick. Yeah. So is, and you're in Avalanche Forecast, you work a lot with the Avalanche Canada Forecasting and the association. Like, is that what you see in Revelstoke year after year? Yeah, I mean, like, typically compared to every other area around us, like, we do have deeper snowpack. We have, like, a big lake effect. And Carl's right, you know, like, it comes off the coast. It hits this big rain shadow, like, desert area through, like, Kamloops and interior. And then it comes up and rails against Monashies. And then, you know, all that lift creates for the next, like, big dump cycle so uh we do have the perfect area we are he's right an inland temperate rainforest uh which is super rare so we do have a lot of moisture um in our area and i think just the way that our valleys work and the winds work um even within like our interior region we have like the rockies who have like this thinner snowpack it's way colder so when they do get snow it's like that deep blower snow um yeah like the Purcells here where we're recording today is a lot different than the Monashies or Selkirks right yeah definitely and even it's it's funny like last year this time we were recording um uh an early season pod or uh what am I thinking an early season webisode for 509 and Regan Riley Cody and I went out and Cody somehow talked us into going up sale early season yeah yeah cool (laughs) Let's go hit the rock garden. <laughs> For whatever reason, it made sense to him. Yeah. So we do that day one. We appease Cody. Okay. And it's exposed. Oh, yeah. As you can imagine. Next day, we go west and we go to the Monashies. Mm-hmm. And oh my gosh. Double. <laughs> yeah, double the snow. Yeah. So even within Revelstoke, there's zones that get yeah. way more precip than there are, you know, others. And it's it's not that far. So no. you start talking like, okay, well, you cross the Rockies over to the east side of the Purcells and it's just like, okay, yeah. You can yeah. see why it's getting less and less as you go east yeah. into Banff and all that area. So it's yeah. pretty cool. What you guys got there is is awesome. So how do you determine in a morning, do you just wake up and look at the hills and say, I'm going to go there today? Yeah, it really depends. Like often I will determine where it looks like the weather looks better by physically looking out my window. Um but usually, you know, you're riding every day, so you kind of have a good idea of where the snow is stacking up. Plus, there's like so many more resources coming online now, webcams and weather stations and all kinds of things. Also, like the Min Report and avalanche.ca, you can go on there and just see like everyone posting what the riding conditions are like everywhere, which is super helpful. How did you get into working with Avalanche Canada? Um, I don't really work... I don't work for them. I'm an ambassador for them. So just promoting like the avalanche safety piece. And as I do anyways, it's just like a part of my day. And I think that's why it works is because I'm not selling it. It truly is a part of my day and it should be a part of your day. And, um, yeah, I think I just was a good fit female sledder. And you live do, in Revelstoke. You do forecasting anyway I do forecasting. for work. So. Yeah. I'm an avalanche professional. So it's just like tick the boxes and Yeah. You know the snowpack. I I don't right now. I haven't been out, but it's already, from what I've heard, like setting up similar to last year, which is not great. I'm hoping that that goes away. And it can fix itself, can't it? Yeah, it definitely can fix itself. And it. I think it should this year. I'm just really hoping we don't have those big, deep, deep, persistent weak layers. What's the biggest thing you want people to take away from hearing you today talk about avalanche safety and avalanche awareness? Um... The biggest takeaway, you've heard it all before, right? You get, I mean, this stuff gets preached to everyone, but just like make sure 
you're trained to ride the terrain you're in and make sure your peers are too, because really when you're under snow and if you've ever had any close calls with anything, being in a tree well, being under a small size one, um, just not having that help right away or people that know how to deal with that situation is like a real aha moment for you. And that's not when you want to be having that aha moment when you're under the snow because your air runs out, then you die. <laughs> Very quickly. So yeah, you know, just kind of making it a part of your day to day and making it common conversation, not like the nerdy thing. Right. You know, I remember uh, when we first started riding big mountain backcountry with professionals, it was like, they're taking risks. You had a banger segment last year where you're going up big drops, things like that. And people are like, Oh, crazy. You know, like what? I couldn't even stand up there. That's true. You know, what's almost crazier though, is the fact that like the less experienced or people that wouldn't do those tricks are still taking higher risks by riding in different trains that, you know, because maybe we've been so experienced or being around professionals like yourself, we get told or get educated to say like, yeah, we want to avoid that today or in the future, we want to get through here. Let's travel safe as a group. All these certain things yeah. is like, sure, you'll go off a 60, 70 foot cliff but you won't go ride like you mentioned yeah. y- your French uh, a riding partner there yeah. for the day that you had to take his key, potentially potential fiance here Yeah, <laughs> that you got to take their key. So it's less like they'll ride that, but you know, they won't take this. So I think it's just like understanding those risks, you know, and yeah, not saying and like, you don't know it until you know it. So take the course, right? That's it. Cause I, I, we all started there and I look back to my early years of sledding and it was like, mind-blowing and I'm I don't care I'm humble I'll own it but I was like clueless yeah. right I had been sledding for a couple of years before I even took an AST course I look back to the train I was in and I'm lucky I'm alive yeah. I had a peeps 457 like the analog like is it beeping <laughs> listen it, be- is that a red light like it's you like know, a world war ii submarine <laughs> it is <Are> here? <laughs> like <laughs> it's uh you know you look back and you you learn from that yeah and, I think one thing that helped a lot back in the days the sleds weren't quite as accessible as they are today like 100%. now you can get you know a 200 horse turbo from factory with warranty turn the key you have yep. to know nothing about backcountry and just access wherever that thing will take you and it's pretty yep. mind-blowing at where it'll go so i think there was a bit of that and it almost helped keep a lot of us alive back in the day riding through the 80s and 90s and where backcountry riding existed but it was less like you know we talked to a few others about like they really didn't go out into the spring. They were limited where they could access for terrain. Yep. And it was just a little bit more moderated. Nowadays, it's like, it's an open book. You yep. can get anywhere, go anywhere. And in a quick period of time, you're hundreds of kilometers from the truck. And like, now what? You know? Oh, for sure. So it puts it in perspective pretty quick. Yeah. So avalanche professional, thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. No Thanks problem. for educating us all, as <laughs> always. Tell us about the stunt gigs you've done. Like yeah. through Hollywood. So you've done a lot. You've wore a lot of different hats as a professional snowmobiler with guiding, being on camera, all these sorts of things. But you've also had some experience through Hollywood. Take us through what it's like to be a stunt rider, snowmobiler in a Hollywood film. Yeah, it's it's interesting for sure. Um, I don't know how many NDA documents I signed or what I can talk about, but we're going to go for it here. Um, we're pushing boundaries. Yeah, we're pushing boundaries. But um yeah, I got into that. It would have been 2021. I think it was like during COVID, but I had, oh, it was 2021 because we had just come off like a raging fire year and I was so burnt out in the fall. I just, all I wanted to do was go to Mexico, had my flight booked, was ready. And uh, I get a phone call um, just from a random girl that reached out to me from Instagram, just being like, we're looking for a female sledder for this film. And, um, you know, we found you on Instagram. It has to be like specific. They were looking specifically for someone that hits jumps and like, you know, can get airtime. Yeah, Can get airtime. And I was like, yeah, sounds great. I'm sorry. I cannot do this. Like I, I am going to Mexico. You've already got your mindset. Yeah. My mind was set. I was so tired. And then, um, it was funny because Chris Brown found out through the grapevine that I turned this work down and he called me up and he was like, are you a freaking idiot? (laughs) You've got to do this. Yeah do you know how much you get paid? And I was like, well, 
it doesn't matter. I don't, yeah, like, I'm not I, doing I'm it. I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then he told me how much he had gotten paid for a previous job he did. And I was like, oh, okay, shit. well, flights are canceled. <laughs> yeah. So I phoned this girl back and I'm just like, so yeah, my trip got canceled. Can, uh, do you still need me? And she was like, yes. So it was like so random. Nice. And, uh, I got this job. I spent like a month up in Terrace filming as JLo's stunt double for the mother. You got to be JLo. I got to be the hero. Yeah. That's so cool. It was pretty sweet. Um, but you know what? You like think the stunt world, the stunt world is rad and it's like a tighter knit community than the sled world. I've got like a family now in like the stunting world. And, uh, yeah, so we, you go up, there's a lot of waiting around cause it's like, this was like a hundred million dollar production and it's like, you understand why it costs so much when you see how it works. <laughs> So it's pretty funny because you wait around a lot. You're not allowed to do anything that's not your job because it's all unionized. Like I wasn't even allowed to adjust my brake lever because that wasn't my job. And uh, yeah, just like... You had a full-time mechanic to adjust brake levers. Yeah, but I had to bring them up from the bottom. So I needed to adjust my brake lever and it took two hours. And I was like, you know what? I don't know if I can work in this world. Maybe I'll just ride through it. It's okay. The brake lever's fine. It'll be fine. (laughs) But um, yeah, it's pretty cool. We got to scope out all the stunt areas. We knew what shots they needed. I've worked with film a lot, although not to that capacity, but uh, just being able to like line things up and be efficient and get them done. I had a snowcat at my disposal to like build my jump. It had to be this gap jump because there was a guy riding under it and it was like a shoot shooting scene. And did uh, you get to ride a sled with a fake gun and you're shooting it off the side? Yeah. Badass. They actually like CGI so much in Hollywood. So I was like riding around with this fake gun like all the time. It was really annoying because it's rubber and it's kind of heavy. And uh, and then for that scene, all I did was like hold my arm out without the gun. And then they like use computer graphics <laughs> to like put it in a gun on the it. movie. Yeah. And then even just like some of the scenes where I was like facing the camera, I was like, how's this going to work? And they just like splat JLo's face on my face. And I'm like, wow. Those are not small <laughs> shoes to fill. You were no. JLo. Like, yeah. were you intimidated going like, I'm JLo? <laughs> like, that'll be me? Well, I don't think so. Cause I, you don't work with the actors very much. I ended up, I did work with her for part of a day, which was kind of cool to actually meet her. She's really nice by the way. Um, but yeah, it's you not work- like you're squirreling her around on a sled and she's like, oh, take me around yeah. here and you're now best friends. N- Nothing like not that. Not like that. Like they can't do anything because I think their insurance companies don't allow them to. They're worth a lot. Yeah, they're worth a lot of money. So the stunt team's going around doing like all the work and like hustling. And then like the main unit is like doing the acting scenes. Um, so it all gets connected. But uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. There's like... You know, when we're filming a sled segment, there's like a couple of us, a few people for backup in case something happens, maybe one or two filmers. This is insane. This is like A camera, B camera, drone, massive drone, bigger than my sled, then like 300 other people. Then there's like the just the like wardrobe guy that is assigned to me that just touches you constantly like in a in a great way in a well yeah it's just <laughs> professional like, masseuse all the time <laughs> you have to look exactly like j-lo so if you're like one shoulder strap is like off it's like he's always touching you adjusting and like, something got so mad at him i felt bad i was like you have to stop touching me i can't take this i'm not even like shooting right now we're literally standing watching he's like this is, this is why i'm a forester and i work in the bush all the <laughs> no. time i do not want someone touching me 24 no. 7. he's like this is my only job <laughs> please don't fire please me please don't fire me and i was like oh my god okay fine touch me it's <laughs> <laughs> so funny in the end when you watch the final product were you like that's what they had me do I know. And like you do all this work. Like I said, I was up there for a month. And I think um, like in that film that is like five minutes and like the sled scenes are like tiny clips and these shots that took us all day, these 300 people, these six cameras that were probably like, you know, 50 to a hundred thousand dollar shots. And there's literally two seconds of it in the film. (laughs) And you're like, oh. But you're in the credits. Yep. Yeah. Your name was in the credits. It was in the credits. Just look close. That's so cool. Do you think you're going to do more of it in the future? Yeah, I actually picked up another one. This spring, I did nice. another one out in Kantanaskis. But it's funny. This time, I wasn't the hero. I was just like a stunt person. And if you have the choice, which I don't think I do. I'm just like now a random stunt person. <laughs> right. Be the hero. Because like 
I you- had to do a lot of bails in the second one I've done. And it was like, not big bails, but like you're still falling off your sled on hard pack. And I was like, oh yeah, that hurts. But the hero doesn't usually bail. That's right. Which is kind of nice. They're always winning. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good, good to know. Be the hero. Be the hero. When you can. That's yeah. awesome though. That, it's so cool to see that. When I know when that film came out, I was just like, just watching through it. <laughs> oh, stop. Okay. Look, oh, there she is. <laughs> like, that's her. <laughs> People were way more excited about that than anything else I've done in my life. Like, you were J-Lo's stunt double? Yeah. You've made it. <laughs> you made are now it. there. <laughs> but did you see my two-minute segment leading up to that, like, where I actually did, like, all the stunts myself and it was yeah. all me? Oh, yeah. No, that was cool. But you were J-Lo. <laughs> two seconds on the big screen. That's awesome. So classic. So what do you do for <laughs> when you're not stunt doubling and you're not a professional snowmobile? What do you do for day-to-day operations for a job? Yeah, I actually am a forester. So I was doing that for a bunch of years for the local mill, sawmill, Downey Timber in Revelstoke. And then one year I was just up and bought a wildfire fighting company. That was in 2020. So since then I've owned my own company. So we just do, yeah, I I have firefighting crews. I don't go out and fight fires because I'm just like the mom in the HR department. You're logistics. Someone's got to be back. Oh yeah. It's a lot of logistics too. Like, you know, we've had some pretty raging fire seasons the last few years. Um, And then the fall we do, yeah, some forestry projects and fuel management, which is like fire smarting. You were talking about the effects of preventative maintenance in the fire, like, you know, like controlling that fuel and... And you saw the effects firsthand in some of the Kelowna fires. Like, take us through that. Like, what you were looking at the pictures, you're like, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Like, there there is a sh- shift ongoing right now where it's just like we're spending millions, billions of dollars on suppression because these seasons happen and it's just like you got to throw everything you got at it. So, you know, there's now more buckets of money coming out to try and do the mitigation piece in hopes that we can not lose homes and not spend as much money like putting all these wildfire resources like you people like you and me that are out there literally fighting fires for like 90 days of their summer and uh yeah so we do that kind of work and we're thinning out the forest cleaning out all the understory and kind of just making it so the fires can move through them without lighting big raging fires do you like that diversity of you know wearing a few different hats obviously your personality is always kind of like accepting new challenges and kind of seeing that like is is that your life ongoing do you think yeah i i think somehow i like it it's punishing like i do too much and i i know that and i've been trying to fix it for like 20 years but i think it's again leads to that personality type where you're just like i can't sit still i get bored really easy so if i don't have something on the go and then something planned for after that then i just i'm like what's next yeah and what is next this season? You're talking about maybe engaging in some rimshaw races or something like that. How excited are you to maybe try that? Because you ha- like there was a Western BC yeah. uh, hill climbing for a little bit and you kind of dipped your toes in that a little bit. But to go down to the States to compete in the highest level of hill climb racing, which is rimshaw with yeah. guys like, you know, Jay Menaberry and Blaine and Carl and all these guys. Totally. How cool would that be? I'm looking really forward to it. I've never been to Jackson Hole. I'm not going to do any other races. I'm just going to show up and go <laughs> full tilt. Listen here. I don't even worry about the others. I just no. go straight to Jackson. And, you know, it's going to go one of two ways. and Or maybe one of two or three or four ways. I don't know. but It might go sideways. It could go sideways. But I have all the right teachers. So, you know, like Jay and Blaine are going to help me out. And Carl's going to be there. And... uh like Jay and Blaine are going to help me build a sled out of their spare sleds. And how cool is that? I also think like that culture is so different. Like I'm immersed in sledding for sure. But like that American like racing Jackson hole hill climb culture is like something that I'm looking so forward to. I'm going to crack a couple bud lights. (laughs) Oh wait, maybe just Budweiser. Bud heavies. Bud heavies. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, hopefully do some training in this season with Carl and stuff and then just kind of show up and wing it. And I just want to see how that goes. Just how do you think it's going to go? I think it's going to go good. Yeah, that's right. Bring a hundred percent confidence into this and it's going to go great. Yeah. When you stand at Jackson, I've been there a few times and you look down, it's not like being on Revelstoke mountain resort or kicking horse where you're a little bit removed from town and you know, it's a big mountain, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's flowy 
when you're at Jackson and you look down, you are <laughs> basically looking to the million dollar bar entrance. Like you were looking into downtown because it's so steep. <laughs> really? Are like, you trying to scare me? No. Because it's not working. No, I just think when, you, <laughs> when you're like, which way is it going to go? One of four ways. It's just like, <laughs> let's, again, Carl's going to prep you for this yeah. around here in, in BC, but it's just like, <laughs> it's yeah. It's prepare to go piece. up and then all this hill climbing we were talking about in the back country, we'll just, just put hours on it. Just go up and just experience that. Just pin it, I think. Just pin it. You know what? And like, I do race a little bit of mountain biking here and there. And it's just like, my mentality is go fast where you can. But I think on Jackson Hole, you kind of just have to go fast the whole time. I think it's honestly, from what I saw being there, it's a matter of like living through it. It's not a matter of like <laughs> being as fast an orangutan. It's a matter of like, okay, I got to get past this gate to get yeah. to the next cat track or else this thing is going down, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. And like the hill help, that's yeah. a whole culture in itself. I know. Like, the hill help out there and... There was, what was that dude wearing a t-shirt, like a Hawaiian t-shirt last year, grabbing sleds and stuff. He's like this huge linebacker from the NFL. I'm sure of it. I know. It was just, it, it's cool to see. But like you said, it, it's cool that we have an extended sled family, no matter if you're in Canada or the States or wherever, and yeah. guys willing to help you to build sleds out of their spare parts. And guys like Carl, he, the, who's bring up, brought other people there, like Jason Ribby and stuff like that. And he always yeah. kind of brings a contingency out there. Did Shelly try it? She was there? I think Shelly raced last year. Yeah, sure. I, th- I think she was there too, yeah. which is super cool. So you've got a huge family that'll help you get yeah. to the top. And once you get there, it's going to feel pretty good, I think. Yeah, well, it is. Good we'll luck see. with it. Diener, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're excited to see what undercover projects you have coming up this winter. And uh, yeah, and good luck with the charity ride this year. It's going to be awesome. Cool. Thank you.